Доброе утро, дорогие друзья. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are happy to welcome you at the 18th Assembly held in Moscow. The 18th Assembly held in Moscow is the biggest event in medicine. The Assembly allows to get acquainted with the technologies of the future in terms of diagnosis and treatment of the diseases, new forms of organizing medical care and approaches to train people. The Assembly is open to experts as well as general public who is interested in longevity and health. Before we start the next session about the topical issues of dermatovenerology, I'd like to highlight the following. Assembly Health in Moscow is not just an opportunity to discuss of the professional issues and not just an opportunity for the general public to get acquainted with the novelties. We are also drawing the conclusion of a medical festival called Formula of Life. It has been on since 2012. For all the medical professionals, it's an opportunity to share experience and an opportunity to show the general public uh, a true image of a contemporary doctor without any stereotypes. Every person who dedicates his or her life to medicine is a true hero. Of course, for every doctor, a true recompense is the health of the patient but the recognition of the colleagues is also an impetus to further develop and now we would like to give the award of the specialist of the year in the nomination of dermatovenerologist the host of the ceremony will be a person who dedicated an important part of his life to medicine. It's the moderator of our session. Let us welcome here today Nikolai Potikaev, doctor of medicine, professor, chief um, out-of-staff specialist in dermatovenerology and cosmetology of the Ministry of Health of Russia, head of the Research and Practical Center of Dermatovenerology and Cosmetology of the Department of Healthcare of Moscow. Before we start the award procedure, let us give the floor to our moderator. Thank you. Dear friends, it's a great pleasure for me to see all of you so early here today. We are starting our sessions almost without delay, and we are the first ones who are conducting scientific sessions as part of the Moscow Health Assembly. We know very well that it's not the first assembly, but uh, for the first time we are having such a representative forum with a big number of uh, experts invited from foreign countries. That's the first assembly like this. Our whole name is Pavlov. You know very well that Pavlov is a great physiologist of Russia and it's not a mere coincidence because um, we also have some other halls dedicated to Sklifosovsky and other renowned surgeons but Pavlov uh, dealt with physiology and physiology deals with any medical discipline uh, so our whole is very transversal indeed. On the one hand, that's uh, uh, really a narrow branch. On the other hand, it is multidisciplinary because we are dealing with all the areas of medicine. And I see here today not just dermatovenerologists, and uh, I'm very pleased to see other colleagues uh, who are enthusiastic about listening to what we have to say here. And. Uh, now we are going to have a short award ceremony. We have been discussing the candidate for this ceremony. Then we had uh, some numerous uh, discussions uh, where we considered uh, various candidates, including candidates from our center. And uh, the award goes to dermatovenerologist of uh, Hospital 52. Igor Nemasov. I uh, know Igor for a long time already. He's an expert. I'd like just to say a couple of words about Igor. 
Igor has been dealing with uh, very severe cases. He is working in a multidisciplinary hospital, so of course he receives some severe patients who sometimes require intensive care with um, pulus, dermatosis, acute uh, edema and uh, other severe cases. We have been discussing ver various cases between ourselves. Uh, recently we discussed the syndrome of Stevenson Johnson, so he's a very um, experienced expert indeed. Thank you very much, Nikolai. I believe uh, that uh, this uh, award is the result of uh, many years of hard work of all of our team. I have been working in close connection with all the doctors who are working in, the, in our research and practical center, and I'm also working with Nikolai. So thank you very much indeed for your trust. So, dear moderator, dear winner, let us make a joint picture. So, please make the picture of our two experts. So, our photographers are going to make some pictures now. Igor, congratulations once again upon your victory. I wish you success in your work. Please go to the audience and we are going to continue. I'm going to give the floor again to our moderator. We are going to speak about the topical issues of dermatovenerology and the session will start right now. Dear moderator, you have the floor. The session is on. Dear colleagues and dear speakers, dear speakers, please take your seats. Here we have uh, chief uh, expert allergologist immunologist Mr. Pampura uh, from the Department of Healthcare of Moscow. And we have some other colleagues. Is everyone here? No one is missing. The mic is working. That's perfect. Dear friends, I think that I'm not going to dwell on the introduction so that we have more time for the presentations. Maybe we can start. Uh, um, maybe it is not very ethical, but my presentation comes the first, and uh, I as a moderator have to announce myself. Um, well, since, since I have already been presented, I'm just going to start my presentation. I would like uh, our technical experts to put on my presentation and I would also like to understand whether I have to speak from my seat or I have to stand well I think I will remain seated that's good uh, that uh, we are not in ancient Greece where um, I would have to lie down in order to speak Dear friends, uh, I know many of uh, you, especially those who are working in our center, and you are perhaps aware of the subject that I am going to cover. I have already made this presentation in some of the Russian regions where we traveled in order to exchange experience on this subject. The subject is early diagnosis of melanoma. You know that uh, this year is the year of cancer. That is why we pay a lot of attention to this issue. In addition, we've heard calls to include the diagnosis uh, of m skin cancer in the uh, checkup programs. I think that this is correct, but we have to start with ourselves. Uh, and we, as dermatovenerologists, have to pay a lot of attention to the screening of uh, 
patients and uh, share our experience regarding the diagnosis of neoplasms and uh, of their malignant nature in order to direct the patients in a correct way. I'm going to present the Moscow experience. I will not dwell on some of the slides because um, some of the slides are dedicated to just to immerse you in the context, context. I'd like to welcome now the chief expert of the Ministry of Healthcare on Plastic Surgery and chief out-of-staff expert of the Department of Healthcare on Plastic Surgery. Um, colleague, are you going to say a couple of words? Good morning, dear colleagues, dear Nikolai. I'm very happy to be present uh, at this event, uh, the Healthy Moscow Assembly that is dedicated to the development of healthcare, to the promising areas that uh, are going to allow us to reach a new professional level. And overall, it is dedicated to some state of the art technologies. Uh, so that more people are aware of them and could use them for their professional and creative activities. Today we are on a threshold of interesting changes. I'm speaking about the creation of medical centers or clusters as well as uh, creating the standards of relations uh, between the medical experts and the patients. So I think that all these issues will be covered at the assembly and of course, as always, I'm very happy to participate in sessions dedicated to dermatovenerology and cosmetology. Thank you very much to Nikolai Potikaev who is not forgetting me. We have uh, always uh, been working together and elaborating joint approaches in order to improve the health uh, and well-being of our patients. Actually, we don't have a lot of time. We will have to finish at uh, 9.30, so I will have to be quite brief. So, uh, as for the relevance uh, of this problem, of course, it is uh, very relevant because uh, at the end of 20, 2018, uh, we've had uh, more than 3 million of uh, melanoma patients. By statistics, we know that uh, skin, the organ that we are dealing with, the biggest organ in the human body, uh, is uh, on the second place for women and uh, on the third place for men in terms of uh, malignant tumors and uh, quite uh, often patients come to the doctor at a late stage of the disease so our goal is to identify this tumor as early as possible to refer the patient to the <coughs> oncologist so that the oncologist can do all the necessary uh, so, uh, uh, and um, um, together with neuroblastoma, uh, and uh, you all know uh, that um, very often uh, in uh, mass media, uh, so there is information about uh, this or that famous person that uh, he has uh, a brain tumor, and we know that in some period of time these people die. But uh, they don't speak so much about melanoma. Because uh, people die not uh, because of skin uh, uh, lesions, but because of, met of um, uh, tumor expansion. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, uh, incidence rate uh, of melanoma grows, unfortunately, and this is uh, the world uh, trend. Uh, it happens not only in Russia, but in the whole world. And um, uh, so this can be, of course, a separate lecture. And why um, does the incidence uh, rate of melanoma grows? Um, uh, the mortality rate during the first year declines, um, uh, and uh, to also in Moscow, uh, to some degree, and uh, this is quite apparent, uh, will um, 
uh, understand it soon uh, out of my uh, next uh, slides. Our task is uh, to detect melanoma as early as possible. Earlier, uh, so it means at the first or second uh, stage uh, um, and better the first stage when we speak about tumor uh, which uh, grows only um, um, uh, in the skin and it doesn't uh, uh, give metastasis uh, in lymph nodes because this is already the second stage and the third stage. Uh, we uh, have the method of dermatoscopy and uh, we use it quite often and if we use it often uh, our quality of diagnos diagnostics uh, will be improved uh, please uh, look at the stages so what situation do we have now uh, 2015 uh, 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 so um, uh, 2016 uh, data, we don't have the statistics yet, uh, and uh, we uh, collect this uh, uh, regarding our nosology and also oncologists will give us this data. And uh, we, uh, we um, send um, our um, specialist oncologists. Uh, we have a contract about uh, feedback. Uh, each uh, quarter, oncologists uh, have to give uh, the results to us, uh, the results of their um, examinations of those patients uh, whom uh, we have sent. Because uh, we send the patients with some uh, suspicions, uh, uh, and if uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it was really uh, like this, um, uh, so oncologists will uh, give this information. So so we'll have another statistics, our statistics, uh, internal statistics, um, but still we, we um, examined a lot of patients and you can see how many patients we have uh, uh, during several months. So the second, the first stage, uh, the majority of cases, so this is good uh, because this is uh, health saving uh, technology. Uh, we have Moscow uh, sci Scientific Center, this is our headquarter, we have 16 branches. And here uh, you uh, can see practically all the heads of the branches. And um, we also uh, had uh, some opened some departments. We had a roadmap which consisted of several phases, uh, document phase, uh, documentary phase, uh, when uh, we prepared some documents um, for the project uh, to become true. Uh, and um, this is uh, a big organization, 1,800 people work in these organizations. Uh, in this organization, um, uh, it's uh, scattered around Moscow. We have a lot of branches in Moscow, and that's why we have uh, some certain rules in these uh, documents and the decrees, regulations, and so on. And uh, one of the regulations was uh, to open uh, uh, diagnostics labs um, in each branch. We opened a special lab, a special department, so to say. We did not have some uh, repair works, uh, but just in the room uh, of dermatovenerologists, uh, there were some other specialists uh, with uh, uh, some other backgrounds uh, and they uh, tackled other issues. Uh, this were screening uh, rooms and also we created an expert uh, department and from screening department um, uh, patients go um, uh, to this um, uh, to, to, to this um, main um, department uh, if uh, for example diagnosis, the diagnosis is not clear of this or that patient. And here also uh, we uh, make a pass skin passport for patients um, who have um, uh, a lot of um, lesions and uh, this skin passport uh, can help us uh, to evaluate each mole within one year or six months. It depends uh, on uh, the frequency of doctor's visit of these patients. But um, usually within one year we do this uh, monitoring of this or that mole and uh, we scan um, our skin um, uh, coverage then we can create the second uh, skin passport we um, compare uh, this uh, two skin passports if we have some changes in moles uh, like uh, color change uh, its expansion or maybe some other elements appear uh, so in this case, um, it's already a signal for us uh, for some additional attention regarding this uh, ne neoplasma. Uh, uh, so we have one of uh, this patient uh, who has 1,169 uh, um, neopl neoplasms. Um, 
And uh, for this, uh, we have this fourth um, imaging. So we have the following algorithms. It's not complicated. Patients come to our uh, departments. Um, uh, so these are the former um, dermatovenerological um, uh, clinics. Um, and uh, uh, we can use also the method of uh, telemedicine uh, when our specialists um, um, uh, communicate with patients remotely, uh, or patients can go to the expert um, department. And in this expert department, our best specialists work. And uh, then uh, this expert uh, experts in the expert department, uh, they uh, define uh, the um, route um, of um, <coughs> And these patients. Uh, so uh, there are many ways, and also uh, patients can come to oncologists if this is melanoma. And this is the result of our um, investigations. Um, uh, so our experience uh, should be spread. And for this, we have all the preconditions and support. 85,000 people um, uh, came to us. Um, uh, maybe not um, since the first January, because on the first January we only started to do documents. But since March uh, till October, 85,000 85, people came to us. And uh, you can see the majority of people um, came not with very uh, scary diseases, which are not malignant. About 5,000 among 85,000 uh, patients um, <coughs> were detected uh, having malignant um, um, malignant lesions uh, and uh, then out of this 5000 2000 uh, really um, uh, so uh, so really had this malignant um, lesions um, uh, so here you can see uh, 337 cases of melanoma 80 cases of um, uh, flat cell skin cancer four cases of patched disease and um, so this uh, took part only within several months. Um, we understand that we have the largest um, institution in Moscow regarding our dermatovenerological profile. But uh, you know how many dermatologists work in private centers. Once um, I um, came to the site um, um, uh, and um, uh, typed in dermatovenerology department. Uh, we have um, quite um, a bunch of dermatovenerologists and private centers, and uh, uh, so we had so many people uh, studying at this at, at our faculties, uh, and uh, uh, so each year. We have 100 people graduated uh, from our um, um, faculties. Uh, uh, and uh, so if every year we have 100, uh, 200 graduates, uh, so the specialists, these experts, the dermatomineurologists, uh, they also have to work. So within 10 uh, years, um, you know, um, uh, they um, are really, their number is soaring of these specialists. Uh, and where do, uh, do they go? Usually to the private centers. So, um, and uh, when patients come to oncologists, also there is an algorithm of work. This experience uh, proved to be unique. Um, and uh, also, it saves uh, time of oncologists. Of oncologist um, because um, uh, you can see 5,000 suspicions and uh, even more because uh, we uh, had 85,000 people came but uh, these people already were examined but trained people and um, uh, for example some people uh, some patients were sent to expert centers some others uh, were uh, sent to oncologists and uh, so um, we um, uh, save time uh, of oncologists and uh, oncologists um, are they um, um, be, are busy uh, not only with skin but with all um, possible types of cancer and we had also the decree of the government um, in the Ministry of Healthcare uh, that we have to participate also uh, in preparation uh, <coughs> um, 
in preparation of our activities, um, and we have um, uh, to, to, to participate uh, in uh, screening um, procedures. We have to cooperate uh, with um, uh, also um, uh, so general practitioners, uh, doctors, um, uh, and. Um, uh, we had uh, the following degree for us um, uh, to start uh, educational um, uh, procedures. Uh, we had uh, um, uh, to have knowledge uh, training which we can receive only through receiving information, uh, needed information for our work. And that's why we developed the module. Uh, you can see here uh, we have a lot of um, uh, departments here. I spoke uh, yesterday with uh, Mrs. Trapkina. Uh, this is uh, the uh, chief dermatologist in our center. I asked um, uh, her about um, uh, the brochures which we um, which will come into circulation, uh, and uh, she said she said that there will be a lot of uh, brochures um, of this ed educational brochures uh, on on our portal. Also, we have um, this interactive educational module. What is it? This is so you can go to uh, Ministry um, of Healthcare site and you can see here uh, the following algorithms. Uh, you can choose, um, uh, for example, educational trajectory. You can um, select um, additional education, uh, and then uh, you choose. Uh, this um, so early detection of malignant um, uh, uh, lesions or tumors, and uh, uh, so uh, physicians uh, can uh, read this material and um, also look at the images to understand uh, what uh, uh, what uh, neoplasma he, uh, he can see. Uh, uh, here we have a lot of slides, uh, a lot of pictures, a lot of images, and uh, physicians, uh, uh, even uh, even general practitioners, can understand what it what it is, the nature of this um, neoplasma. Uh, so these are educational uh, webinars. Um, that's also of of help. Um, and one uh, of the most important tasks. Um, based on our experience uh, uh, to create algorithm of training of uh, physicians. And uh, uh, so uh, we have um, uh, outsourced dermatologist, outsourced physician, uh, general practitioner. Uh, they combine uh, their efforts, um, prepare materials um, on the site. Um, and uh, so then uh, they inform um, uh, chief um, specialists uh, of districts, uh, uh, and subjects, um, and uh, so now we are at this stage, and then uh, we have uh, to conduct our joint master classes uh, to train physicians uh, how to uh, make diagnostics uh, of malignant neoplasmas, skin neoplasmas. Uh, the algorithms will be the same as in Moscow, only uh, I hear. Uh, patients first come uh, to uh, uh, the general practitioner, and uh, not everywhere we have uh, dermatovenerologists, especially in the remote corners of the country. And then, um, um, so uh, here the expert is a dermatovenerologist. And uh, our strategical task uh, of the federal project uh, is the following. We so this model uh, should be um, realized in all regions of Russian Federation, and for this, uh, so what what do we need for this? Uh, so uh, the goals are clear. Uh, we have to reduce um, the um, budget, but for this uh, also uh, we ne we need um, technical e equipment uh, and. Uh, Uh, so uh, and it cannot be compared with computer tomography equipment, but still uh, we need investment. Uh, so it's much less, but still we need investment. Uh, and uh, now we're discussing the investment issues. One of the methods uh, uh, will be a digital uh, mapping, uh, dermatoscopy. Uh, uh, so, but it will be not in, su in the subject, but in the district. Uh, and then also it goes uh, to each uh, subject of the Russian Federation. We'll have this equipment everywhere. 
for uh, dermatoscopic visualizations as ZDI. It's very similar to um, skin passport. And one uh, of the most important thing here is uh, application of the uh, AI uh, methods. Now, um, uh, if a dermatoscope is used um, uh, uh, and um, I can understand what it is, apopilome, a melanoma, uh, but um, uh, for uh, a general physician, uh, it will be much more uh, complicated to do this. And in this case, AI can help uh, him. Uh, because besides uh, of uh, a dermatoscope, he will have a smartphone uh, uh, with some applications and AI uh, will be uh, um, uh, also working uh, here as, a, as uh, the program. It will help a general physician and uh, in this case it will be an additional resource um, uh, for him uh, uh, to um, understand what diagnostic, the diagnosis it can be. Um, and uh, also, uh, in this case, uh, this physician can uh, send patient to oncologist or dermatoneurologist. Uh, so uh, this is not so expensive, a mobile dermatoscopy on the basis of telemedicine. But for this, uh, we need uh, the proper logistics um, roadmap and also a desire uh, to uh, realize this project. We have this desire. We, ha we are working at the roadmap. We know the logistics. Um, and that's why uh, I think it's all possible. And then uh, we can save this databases because it will be visualization and these images can be saved. Um, uh, then uh, they will add uh, the database of AR further and uh, a lot of images can be created, uh, which then will be used in practice for other, for other doctors, also for AI, for new versions of AI. This, uh, the first level will look like this, the medical organization, healthcare clinics, hospitals, um, um, regional hospitals, um, uh, so uh, the chief um, doctor, uh, so specialists, uh, the general practitioner or uh, the uh, dermatoneurologist. Uh, so the, the tasks, um, uh, dermatoscope or um, AI or, and patient examination, of course. And then um, a dermatoneurologist examines um, and then uh, uh, he's more qualified and then uh, he sends this patient to the expert um, center. First it will be a district uh, center and then maybe subject center. And then uh, the foreign experience um, is the fallen. In Brazil, um, Uh, the uh, the same uh, similar system was uh, the uh, similar project was conducted uh, and they detected uh, uh, six thousand patients uh, and uh, the detection level was three percent as for our experience you can see that uh, uh, this uh, indicator is of seven percent so our experience thus uh, exceeds uh, that of uh, Brazil uh, in terms of detection of melanoma or suspicion of melanoma. So uh, when we are speaking about the implementation of our federal project, we pre-selected several cities where we are going to put the system into practice. One of such uh, ambitious goals is to create the uh, Russian systems of dermatoscopy including a photo finder and um, we are thus going to uh, develop our own systems uh, and support the experts who are dealing with that if we develop such a system in russia it will be cheaper and uh, more efficient for us so i'm not going to speak further to leave some some time to speak for my colleagues. I've shared uh, our experience and I'd like to seize this opportunity to thank my colleagues who took an active part in the implementation of this project. And uh, I would also be happy to communicate uh, on this issue with uh, our colleagues from other regions who have also had some positive experience. Thank you. Our next speaker
will be focusing on scientific issues, um, genetic engineering in uh, um, psoriasis uh, patients. So the speaker uh, is uh, Mr. Dmitry Serov, who is head of the Department of Specialized Medical Care in the Moscow Research and Treatment Center of Dermatovenerology and Cosmetology. Dmitry, you have the floor. Please uh, get the clicker. Dear Nikolai, dear colleagues, I am going to speak first of all about uh, a review of uh, the modern treatments of psoriasis. If we are speaking about psoriasis, of course, uh, first of all, we are speaking about biological treatment today. If we consider the whole paradigm of psoriasis treatment, Today we witness a shift towards biological medicines. Retrospectively, back in 2007 and 2008, we had only one medicine that we started with. As of today, with every year going by, we witness the production of um, yet another one or two products that allow us to select the treatment uh, for a particular patient uh, in a more precise way, taking into account the comorbid states. First of all, I'd like uh, to highlight that the WHO considers psoriasis as a socially significant disease. It says that in its report of 2016. So um, in the treatment, we have to focus on the patient. At the same time, we have to raise awareness of the disease, uh, contemporary treatment methods, and stop stigma. And, of course, we have to ensure the availability of the treatment. If we consider the model of psoriasis development, today it is uh, seen as follows. First of all, there is genetic predisposition and, uh, in addition, there are some trigger factors. As a result, the psoriatic process is developing. So psoriasis uh, is approached uh, um, to, together with some comorbid states such as uh, obesity, metabolic syndrome, fatty hepatosis, disturbance of tolerance to glucose, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. Another comorbid state is the development of psoriatic arthritis. So when we select the treatment for a specific patient, we always have to take into account some comorbid states. So we shouldn't just consider the state of the skin of the patient. And I'm going to speak in greater detail about uh, uh, the severe comorbid state of psoriatic arthritis. The dermatologist is the first doctor the patient with uh, psoriasis comes to. And that's the first doctor who has to see the early development of psoriatic arthritis and also suspect the development of psoriatic arthritis in future. So first of all, the doctor should pay attention to the change of nails. Our nails are also also consist of the same joint cells. So if we see uh, some changes in nails, we can suspect that uh, our joints have the same changes. There are also some simple questions that can be asked even during the first ambulatory visit. For example, episodes of uh, joint pain, uh, difficulty of moving in feet and hands, also some pains um, in buttocks uh, and uh, in heels, all of that uh, can make us uh, as dermatologists suspicious and send the patient to the rheumatologist so that uh, treatment could be started in good time. Speaking about skin, uh, we can deal with it at any stage, even when uh, the patient comes with a state of psoriatic uh, erythrodermia. Uh, we can treat the state uh, and uh, it will be cured. But if joints are affected, there is a high risk of disabling of the patient. 
without the possibility for him to live a normal life. So dermatologists are in the vanguard of preventing psoriatic arthritis because uh, if there are skin issues, patients usually go to dermatologists and not to rheumatologists. And we always have to remember that. If we consider the treatment choice, we have to take into account several aspects. First of all, the severity of the disease, the comorbidities, and uh, of course uh, the preferences of the patient, because we have to discuss with the patient whether he will be able to really follow the treatment closely. Some treatments require regular inspection and um, presence in a day hospital. Some treatments also require regular visits to the dermatologist. We have to take that into account, of course. And the economic uh, burden also plays a role today. This slide shows the modern approach to the selection of psoriasis treatment. This scheme brings together the choice of treatment not only using biological remedies, but also using some topical products and non-biological systemic treatment. The first thing that we take into account is diagnosis. What are the diagnosis indexes? This is an objective scale to evaluate the severity of the skin process. First of all, there is this index of uh, the surface of lesion, the um, index PASI, and the quality of life index. The dermatology life quality index also plays a huge role. What is it? It's about the compliance with the treatment, about the understanding of whether the patient feels fine with the treatment and whether he's going to follow the recommendations. I can give a simple example. A patient who has uh, uh, the hair and skin affected and uh, the patient may have long hair and using fatty ointments uh, on hair is very uncomfortable and quite often when the patient uses this one or two times he just abandons this treatment that is why we have to take into account uh, uh, the severity of the skin process and also the efficiency of the treatment in terms of how well it is followed by the patient we are mostly speaking about uh, moderate and severe forms of psoriasis and in that case we can consider the systemic treatment as well as biological medicines. If the non-biologic treatment uh, is inefficient or if there are contraindications to prescribing such treatment. If uh, all of these indices are less than 10, we are mostly speaking about the topical forms of treatment. However, here once again we have to speak about the evaluation of the severity of the state. For example, if the patient has uh, eruptions uh, on the visible parts of the body, that will affect the quality of life hugely and uh, is able to trigger depression. So we have to consider these factors as well. If the patient is working with people and the quality of life suffers, perhaps we should start the systemic treatment earlier so that the patient could get rid of this state earlier. Then the treatment is also assessed using objective criteria. It is the regression of the PA SI index. If the regression is more than 75%, that means that the treatment results are good and we can continue the treatment. If it is from 50 to 75, we have to talk to the patient to give him the questionnaire about the quality of life and then decide. Um, if the quality of life is improved, we may continue the treatment. If uh, the quality of life is still affected, we will have to reconsider the treatment. I'm going to speak in greater detail today about systemic treatment. Before I move on to the 
overview of the biological treatments, I'd like to highlight that before prescribing such treatment, we have to remember that we also have some systemic medicines. And um, metotrexate is uh, the golden standard of treating skin forms of psoriasis and prevention of comorbidities. First of all, I'm speaking about psoriatic arthritis. I'd like to highlight that timely prescription of metotrexate has been proven to reduce the mortality level from the comorbidities such as uh, infarctus myocardium. So that's also a good uh, way to prevent uh, cardiovascular diseases. Here you can see the results of quite a long study. It included 600 people and it was proven that the risk of developing cardiovascular complications is reduced by 70%. First of all, that was not a dermatology study, that was a cardiological study and at the same time they assessed patients with psoriasis. Now I'm going to move on to the overview of the biological treatments of psoriasis. I'd like to first of all explain what are biological treatments. These are antibodies to cytokines. Cytokines are the key links of uh, the inflammatory chain in psoriasis. First of all, they included mice antibodies, then they included chimerous uh, antibodies that included uh, mice protein as well as human protein. Then there were some humanized uh, antibodies. So the initial mice protein had the antigen properties replaced by human ones. And then we moved on to the human antibodies. But uh, in the modern world, we are using humanized um, antibodies as well as human antibodies. Uh, the affinity of humanized antibodies is still at a high level, so the treatment starts to be effective earlier. However, there is a high risk of developing neutralizing antibodies. This slide shows all the medicines that are available on our market today. So these are all the treatments uh, available. They include uh, the uh, soluble competitive receptors to FMO alpha, then they include uh, antibodies to the factor of tumor necrosis, they include chimerous antibodies, recombinant human antibodies, antibodies to interleukins 12 and 23, and the last biological treatments include uh, um, antibodies to Neurogen 17. This slide shows the level of impact of biological treatments. So we can uh, um, have an impact on the factor of tumor necrosis alpha, interleukin 23, and then at interleukin 17. And now the treatment focus is shifting towards interleukin 17R. It is interesting for us because uh, it is not just about the classical psoriasis development, but also the immunocompetent cells in a psoriatic plague uh, and in case of joint lesions, interleukin 17A is produced. So when this way is blocked, we often see the lack of efficiency through those collateral factors. If we are speaking about the shifting towards the biological treatments, it has been proven that we can just shift to those medicines without any period. Um, before it was considered that we have to wait for two uh, excretion periods, but now it has been proven that we don't have to wait. Now a small overview of the medicines that we are using so that you understand when we can use different types of treatment. Speaking about um, uh, the first treatment, that's uh, a soluble antibody to the tumor necrosis factor alpha. Uh, 
it is mostly focused on the joints and uh, until today since this is just a soluble receptor it is uh, uh, considered as the most safe biological treatment the next medicine is uh, adalimumab this is uh, the medicine that uh, contains uh, human antibodies to the tumor necrosis factor alpha we are uh, gradually abandoning adalimumab because uh, by week 36 or 38 of treatment almost all the patients develop neutralizing antibodies uh, since there is 25% of mice protein and unfortunately the efficiency of this treatment reduces in case of use of human antibodies we see that the efficiency of the treatment is preserved for a longer period if we are speaking about the less severe forms of psoriasis without any joint lesions we can use the antibodies the treatment containing antibodies to interleukin-12 and 23, such as ustekinumab. This is a medicine based on human antibodies completely. It produces quite a good effect. First of all, in case uh, of uh, skin lesions, lesions and less in case of joint lesions. Another particularity of this product is that it has to be administered once per three months, which is very convenient for the patients. Now, some uh, medicines uh, that contain <coughs> antibodies to interleukin-17 are A. They include humanized antibodies as well as human antibodies. They can be used in case of joint lesions as well as in case of skin damage. What's also good is that this treatment is efficient in case of uh, um, hair, skin uh, damage and other kinds of damage. And now um, uh, you uh, could see um, all uh, medications um, uh, which now are available at our modern market. Now we can say uh, that uh, we try um, um, also um, uh, to go away from uh, the index uh, now uh, considering a big, much, a big um, number of medications, uh, now we speak about the regression of PASI index. Um, uh, this is uh, clean skin practically and uh, more um, medications we use. It's uh, better for us, it's easier for us uh, to select the therapy uh, for one particular patient. And uh, biological therapy, uh, it's very efficient, of course, uh, but uh, still um, uh, we can have the development of the secondary non-efficiency because of the immune response. Even if uh, these are human antibodies, still there is a, there a risk um, uh, of development of neutralizing antibodies, which influence on therapeutic um, uh, influence of medication, and also on non-neutralizing antibodies, which influence on pharmacogenetics. Also, we have recommendations um, about changes, uh, changes of biological therapy if um, uh, there is non-efficiency increase we can have combined therapy uh, dosage uh, change um, or even selecting other types um, of treatment we can say that there are medications which use as the first lines for the skin uh, damage uh, the medications as ustokinimat uh, containing antibodies uh, also medications um, which use uh, when there are joint damages, medications, uh, anti-abortives um, uh, also uh, and uh, the medications which are used for skin damages, joint damages. Uh, more uh, medications will have uh, uh, easier it will be uh, uh, to select therapy uh, for um, particular patients uh, uh, so in this case uh, we'll focus on a particular patient in our center we uh, apply all methods of biological therapy we accumulate our experience um, as well and accordingly very often um, 
Uh, we can share our experience uh, at the conferences. And I can say that our experience at present, um, um, you know, exceeds uh, the experience of many countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dmitry. Uh, you fit our schedule very well. Our next uh, um, presentation are uh, Tricology and Innovation Technologies. Um, uh, the uh, presenter, uh, Professor Aida Kajigorova, uh, Chief Scientific uh, Employer. Uh, so uh, the innovation directions in trichology include a lot of aspects, uh, uh, trichoscopy, new non-invasive methods, uh, uh, and also creation uh, of different uh, um, biometric peptides, um, uh, new forms, approved uh, cellular therapy and gene uh, engineering. Uh, uh, trichoscopy is not uh, uh, the new method for us. Of course, we used it earlier, but only recently we developed the main criteria indicators of uh, trichoscopic uh, markers. Uh, of, um, uh, which um, allow us um, to avoid uh, invasive diagnostics uh, method, uh, golden standard um, um, bi biopsy. Uh, we can use knowledge um, based on many uh, research. Uh, I can't say uh, uh, that we uh, have just received this knowledge. Even 10 years ago, uh, 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 Dr. Patikaev uh, read the book uh, um, uh, and uh, dedicated to uh, trichoscopy. But one year ago, um, uh, Atlas of Trichoscopy uh, was edited, uh, um, which uh, was made under uh, uh, control of uh, Professor Rudnitsky. We have here uh, a lot of knowledge uh, and on, at our 12th uh, forum of dermatologists and cosmetologists in March it was presented to 2019. Our section was very successful. A lot of um, doctors uh, bought this book uh, and uh, <coughs> Uh, Professor Ovcherenko also was uh, the author of translation of this book. Now you can see several examples uh, for practical application of uh, trichoscopy. You can see here three patients on the slide. It seems uh, uh, the diagnos di diagnosis is quite clear. Um, alopecia areat in the first case, uh, and in the second third cases, um, it, it seems um, that it can be uh, just uh, uh, Another form of uh, alopecia areata, but if we use uh, dermatoscope, visualize uh, some uh, uh, symptoms, um, we can see um, uh, the different uh, diagnosis. Uh, so the images will never prove um, alopecia areata, but uh, these are different pathologies, uh, not uh, alopecia areata. And, um, you can see uh, different uh, three different uh, diagnoses, and uh, here we don't need uh, a biopsy. Fifty years ago, um, it became apparent that uh, hair follicle um, forms um, <coughs> its um, regular activities uh, as a result of interaction of. Uh, um, in the cellular interactions uh, with particip participation of uh, some enzymes, um, particular enzymes, and then uh, we understood uh, uh, that uh, um, hair follicles are quite isolated, and uh, <coughs> uh, so um, for people uh, also uh, now. Uh, uh, it's possible to clone uh, this um, uh, hair um, uh, follicles. We had a lot of research uh, and um, examination of rats uh, and um, 
mice. Um, but then when uh, we uh, try to focus to um, shift this experience uh, uh, to human practice, uh, these methods were not efficient. But in 2012, it was proved uh, that uh, the main uh, uh, cells uh, which participate uh, in uh, um, the possibilities of um, uh, appearing of new um, uh, high follicles, not only uh, uh, papillus, um, uh, but also uh, the uh, dermal uh, coating, and they all uh, control uh, hair growth. Uh, and uh, um, so within this last uh, decade, we had a very interesting research um, uh, uh, in Georgia uh, at the Medical Institute um, and they proved uh, safety uh, of transplantation of uh, this uh, uh, cells uh, uh, to culture media and uh, we can create a big majority of cells uh, of not, uh, for cultivation of uh, them uh, in uh, uh, problematic zones uh, and this method um, proved to be efficient, but uh, it's very expensive, um, and uh, uh, this um, uh, derma papillus of people uh, uh, also uh, can lose their properties if there are changes of culture. When um, there is uh, the transition from 3D media, where uh, our uh, hair uh, is um, uh, formed uh, and when it's, uh, it goes to 2D media, uh, the, um, uh, uh, such properties uh, are lost. Uh, but still we um, continue our research. I hope that we'll uh, uh, soon uh, get very good results. Now we have three uh, main potent pot possibilities uh, to um, influence on high growth. Um, um, so. Uh, so cultivation, uh, that, that's uh, the first one, and also signal stimulation of cells, of hair follicles, and this is uh, widely used now. Plasma therapy also showed uh, its uh, clinical efficient efficacy, and um, in the majority of uh, mm, uh, research, um, uh, so which were published uh, in scientific um, brochures uh, allowed us uh, to conduct uh, uh, some analysis. Um, we can see good results um, uh, with, uh, so of treatment of patients with um, uh, Sandro uh, alopecia and uh, uh, this was also uh, these results were also included uh, uh, in recommendations uh, uh, for men and also for women. You can see uh, the metatherapy. Uh, uh, it's work. It works as monotherapy also, uh, but it's better to combine plasma therapy, aminoxidine, uh, and uh, you can see the results of uh, this is the photo uh, trichogram of patients uh, who used only monotherapy. The other method, um, which also can be um, uh, called uh, um, the analog um, of um, uh, the uh, plasma therapy, this is uh, uh, stromal vascular activation of hair growth. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this is quite a witty method uh, uh, of usage of donor conglomerates of cells of patients um, uh, from the back of um, uh, the uh, head. Uh, then uh, uh, we um, uh, make injections uh, to the problematic zones of this um, material. and. Um, but the problem of any method Um, but um, uh, the most advanced, most up, 
optimistic method of treatment, uh, unfortunately in Russia that it is not used, uh, is um, um, a detection of stem cells from fat tissue. Because uh, stem cells uh, or adipocytes uh, of uh, fat uh, tissue um, uh, are very good materials. Um, uh, so um, uh, we can use uh, stem cells in any tissue of uh, organisms because uh, uh, they uh, can assimilate um, uh, in uh, uh, the tissues. And uh, I just want to um, represent the results of our colleague uh, from Riga who uses this method of therapy uh, for their patients. Uh, different methods are used uh, uh, to uh, receive um, adipocytes. Um, and um, not only um, uh, when uh, there is hair loss, but also uh, when there are traumas in stomatology. But uh, here, two specialists should work, a surgeon uh, uh, and um, a dermatologist uh, together. And also, we uh, need to have uh, a legal work which can make uh, uh, this uh, 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 this, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, proper. You can see here uh, the results of adipocyte usage. Um, you can see a good result uh, under genetic uh, alopecia, senile alopecia, and um, uh, so here you can see uh, scar alopecia, pseudopilite, broke uh, pseudopilite. But uh, I would like also to mention um, this scientific uh, breakthrough, which w was published, uh, um, uh, you know, several months ago, and uh, uh, it says about um, uh, genetic engineering. Uh, so it was written uh, uh, that hair follicles can be printed um, uh, on a 3D print. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, our media fantasizes too much sometimes, uh, but on the whole, um, I can say that still, yes, we received the first results uh, uh, on um, usage of um, uh, bio, um, uh, you know, uh, compatible models, uh, also uh, bio-compatible gel, which uh, allows uh, uh, to uh, grow um, follicles. Uh, underneath you can see um, uh, the image. Uh, so uh, really uh, here, uh, so you can see uh, we, uh, really hair growth. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, invest uh, the research group uh, is doing this. Um, uh, the group um, uh, of Angela uh, Christian, Columbia University of New York. And uh, soon, uh, maybe, uh, we also have good results here in this area. And uh, also, I would like to mention about uh, success, which we have uh, uh, so regarding alopecia areata, uh, because this is quite traumatic. Uh, uh, we know that patients, even with uh, uh, prima, primary forms uh, of alopecia areata, uh, you know, um, uh, so uh, sometimes um, in the future they uh, don't uh, uh, have um, uh, any hair growth later. Uh, different methods of treatment are used. Uh, uh, usually this is immunosuppression. And for today also we start to use um, biological medications. Um, uh, some uh, medications show efficacy, some not, but, and also um, targeted uh, medications which influence uh, uh, on um, intercellular uh, math, um, ways uh, of um, disease development. And our, and the, our research shows that this therapy, uh, type of therapy is uh, efficient. Um, so now, um, uh, also, a lot of focus um, uh, is uh, on um, application of Janos um, uh, Kinas uh, uh, in uh, treatment uh, of um, uh, alopecia areata. Janos uh, Kinas um, participate in activation um, uh, of um, um, 
activation of follicular um, uh, cells um, and also uh, T on platelets. Um, it causes uh, expression uh, of um, uh, ethylene or cam. cam uh, uh, so then, um, uh, cells uh, uh, and uh, different. Uh, so then, uh, different uh, cells and follicular cells um, are interacted, and this blockator um, breaks um, uh, this um, uh, circle. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, there is no interaction between cells. Uh, development of this uh, direction uh, for today uh, is considered to be quite optimistic, optimistic for treatment of uh, alopecia aureate because uh, these are molecules. Qu these molecules are small, quite safe, um, and uh, we can use them uh, when it's really needed, when we have relapse, um, but not uh, any method named. Uh, um, uh, can guarantee that uh, the re the re there will be uh, no relapse in the future. That's why we improve our treatment methods, we improve them. Last year, in December, uh, we uh, pu published uh, the recommendations uh, regarding treatment of patients with alopecia areata. And in these recommendations, uh, there are a lot of criteria. And uh, we had recommendations uh, how to uh, make up uh, uh, the um, outpatient map uh, which can be used uh, for patients um, uh, for um, um, this alopecia areata uh, and uh, it can be used um, uh, in uh, so in many aspects. Uh, also, I would like to represent uh, the register, which is being, being formed now, and uh, then uh, it will be used uh, actively, um, first of all, on the basis of our scientific practical center. The project, uh, the technical project, uh, uh, the, the technical organization, uh, technical executor and operator, uh, will um, for uh, creation of computer uh, programs uh, uh, will uh, participate in this um, and a physician which works uh, with the patients with alopecia areata uh, can uh, create the database of electronic um, registers um, uh, some tables um, considering um, uh, those um, uh, criteria which uh, were expressed in our guidelines and our recommendations um, is uh, created based uh, on a world project called uh, alopecia areata global registry and i think that such research that would allow to include um, all the patients who come for the first time or recurrently into the electronic records that would allow us to have dynamic visits to fill in the necessary profile forms to conduct uh, research to have uh, images uh, of the patients here before treatment and after treatment that is uh, um, an example of that uh, we have here the patient uh, uh, before the treatment and after treatment. These are not all the pictures that were taken because the back image and front image are missing, but still that's an example of an electronic medical records of a patient with alopecia areata. That uh, information could be included in various questionaries. Uh, if there is a piece of research conducted by a doctor, he or she could use this data to conduct research and most importantly all of that will allow to get online analytics and statistics uh, on all the parameters of the records um, including the age of the patient the diagnosis and so on so thanks a lot for your attention and I'd like to give the floor to the moderator thank you very much I would now like to give the floor to 
as a chief allergologist and immunologist of the Department of Healthcare of Moscow, Professor Pampura, who is going to present uh, his speech with uh, Evgeny Varlamov from the Institute of Pediatrics. Dear colleagues, in the next couple of days, I'm going to speak about uh, allergic diagnosis and the related aspects. Uh, but uh, during this session, I would like to speak about the related matters, uh, about the verification of diagnosis, for example. Uh, you all know that uh, we use the the recognized criteria in order to establish the diagnosis of uh, atopic dermatitis, urticaria, and so on. Uh, we also need to establish the tactic of treatment and to, to prevent relapses. There are some standards of uh, uh, diagnosis that need to take into account the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, the tests uh, need to have certain characteristics uh, for atopic dermatitis, for example, the specificity, uh, um, sensibility, and uh, reproductivity need to be quite high. Uh, also, our tests uh, are not binary, and um, it's, uh, you need to be an expert to understand uh, and um, decipher them. Of course, uh, the um, Diagnostics need to be economically justified and also reply to the demands of the expert. So we need to know how to interpret the test and we need to know what we actually want to get. If we open the classical clinical guidelines, we will see a huge number of tests that have no clinical sense. All of those tests are available in Russia in various quantities and uh, every one of you has probably seen those tests and uh, now I'm going to explain to you how to understand which tests you need and which you don't and how to talk about that to your colleagues allergologists and immunologists so uh, if we are speaking about 20 40 or 50 tests uh, we understand that uh, it is too much uh, um, any good test will cost at least two euros so such a panel of tests uh, will cost around 50 or 70 euros and so on and uh, in every panel of tests there are some items and um, among those items uh, uh, there are not just uh, ingredients such as uh, cow's milk but also sometimes there are um, items um, of products made of milk uh, such as cottage cheese sour cream and so on and that is an indicator that this test is not very good because uh, milk is already part of some of the products included in the panel if we take uh, citrus fruit uh, various citruses in one panel such as orange grapefruit tangerine that also means that this test is not very good and all the other items in this panel will not be of great interest to the expert. In addition, if we have a specific uh, uh, allergens such as rosemary, gelatin, uh, clove, and so on, this is uh, also not a very reliable test. Another important thing we all need to understand is that if the results are presented on such pieces of paper with um, a huge number of uh, uh, components such as uh, coffee, instant coffee, tobacco, and so on. We should not pay a lot of attention to those tests. We would prefer not to conduct them. The experience available in Russia and in many other post-Soviet countries is the detection of uh, um, IgG4 but actually it has no significance for a patient with food allergy another interesting thing is when in the tests uh, uh, we uh, get some indications uh, or recommendations on behalf of the laboratory to the allergologist or the patient but uh, this is uh, also not something to be relied upon uh, what we need to pay attention to is uh, 
that the uh, test results need to be certified. So that's the most important thing for us. Another important point, if there are many parameters that are not clear to you, we have to remember that uh, in case of allergology, we are considering only IgE. As for the other parameters, we can basically disregard them. If uh, in one panel we have uh, pinworm and the, at the same time banana, potato or gluten, that's not also a very good way to design a test. Right. Abroad, uh, um, we see some tests uh, that are accompanied by comments. Um, as I have already said, uh, if the comment is given by the laboratory, we should not take that into account. Here is an example of a classical food uh, test that is available in Russia and abroad. Uh, um, there are many items here, but many things that are not valuable to us. Another important point is the following. If we take allergologists and non-allergologists, and they will consider the same patients, allergologists uh, are going to spend two times less money on diagnosis than non-allergologists. In case of uh, um, some Western countries, uh, non allergologists will spend $400 for a diagnosis and an allergologist will just spend 200 because allergologist is going to select the parameters to be tested that need to be tested in that particular patient without doing any unnecessary tests. Here you can see an example of acute urticaria. You have all probably seen that on pictures or in life. Can I get the next slide, please? Just a couple of words. In case of acute urt urticaria, diagnosis does not have uh, a lot of sense. That is the opinion that was included in many documents. And in these documents, um, it's not commented that uh, um, examination doesn't need to be done only in case of adults. If a child has uh, acute urticaria, examination, of course, has to be conducted. An allergy examination has to be conducted for children, especially younger than two years old. So I understand that I'm running out of time. As for food allergens um, and other allergen, allergens, the um, allergies are hyper-diagnosed in Russia. It is considered that uh, during the first year of life, uh, food allergy has something to do with uh, uh, a topic, uh, dermatitis, uh, only in 30% of cases. Uh, in all the other cases, uh, atopic dermatitis is not accompanied by food allergy. So the significance of, of a food diary is uh, overestimated. It doesn't have a lot of value for atopic dermatitis because uh, it is not a food reaction. In case of atopic dermatitis, we need to remember that uh, this is uh, uh, not an IgE disease. It may be mediated by IgE, but it may be also not mediated by it. Also, we need to remember that uh, there might be some proteins that are not allergens, but if this protein comes on skin, it will still trigger the skin reaction. So diagnosis has to be based uh, on a multitude of factors. Another important reason in allergology as in dermatology, in case of atopic dermatitis, we need to uh, also capture the effects of allergenic microorganisms. Unfortunately, 
the situation in allergology in Russia is not very good. Here you can see the tools that are used for allergy probes and uh, you will if you have a look at them you will be able to say at once which one was produced in Russia. Uh, of course the one with the biggest needle uh, hence it's very difficult to conduct a good test. For allergists there is an important thing. Sensibilization is doesn't equal to food allergy. 50% of healthy um, people have sensibilization. If we say that all these healthy people have allergies uh, and if we start to treat all these people, this would probably be completely senseless. There are also products uh, that can be allowed if the patient has uh, IgE sensibilization and that will actually result in developing tolerance to this product that also needs to be taken into account. There are also some developments in component diagnosis that has a lot of advantages but that's uh, a very specific subject. If we uh, develop it further, we will be able to treat our patients in a different way. Just a small example of that. Here we have a patient with all the negative tests, but when we have a provocative test, we see immediately that he has urticaria uh, for milk, although all the test results were negative. The conclusions are quite clear. Allergy diagnosis uh, is an important component in providing care to patients suffering from allergy dermatosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. I'd like to seize this opportunity to invite you to collaborate more with our center to become a mentor of our new department. We are now having an employee who is coordinating this area and uh, we would be happy to collaborate with you on this subject as well. Thank you, I will be pleased to do it. Colleagues, we are running out of time indeed and uh, our next and final speech is dedicated to sexually transmitted diseases uh, uh, among the students of uh, Moscow. Uh, the speech will be made by Svetlana Palevshikova, head of the Central Laboratory Department. Uh, the co-speakers are Professor Bloomberg and Gushin. They are going to support Svetlana in her presentation. Svetlana, if you could be very brief, we would be grateful. Dear Nikolai, Dear colleagues, all over the world the burden of uh, mortality and morbidity related to sexually transmitted diseases has a negative impact uh, on health uh, of uh, adults, uh, children and uh, newborns. Sexually transmitted diseases lead to cell damages that are precursors for some types of cancer and lead to HIV as well. Every day more than 1 million people aged between 15 and 49 contract uh, treatable sexually transmitted diseases. Every year there are more than 376 million of cases uh, of contracting chlamydiosis, gonorrhea, hon trichomoniasis and syphilis. According to CDC, in the US uh, annually m nearly 20 million new cases of sexually transmitted diseases are recorded. The uh, morbidity of gonococcal infection in the US in 2018 was 179 cases per 100,000 people and chlamydia in women represented 692 cases per 100,000 women and 380 cases per 100,000 men. In the US official statistics take into account the morbidity 
and the incidence of uh, separate cases of sexually transmitted diseases by age, uh, sex, social demographic groups, uh, sexual orientation. Here you can see the incidence of uh, gonococcus, chlamydia and trichomoniasis in Russia in 2018. It was uh, in Russia 84 cases uh, for per 100,000 people and in Moscow 21.8 cases per 100,000 people. To compare with these incidents in the U.S., we can see that in the U.S. the incidence is much higher. The main trend in the epidemiology of sexually transmitted diseases in Russia today is the reduction of incidents after a significant increase that we witnessed in the mid-90s. That uh, also coincided with the USSR collapse. This can be explained by the fact that most, uh, res most tests are microscopic. Their efficiency is quite low. People also tend to, treat, to get treatment in private uh, clinics uh, and uh, they usually don't register sexually transmitted diseases. And also, as of today, many sexually transmitted diseases manifest no symptoms. In Russia, the state statistics uh, doesn't include uh, um, breakdown by age, sex, uh, and other parameters. However, in the world, uh, 20 to 50 percent of cases uh, of sexually transmitted diseases are encountered in people of reproductive age. Half of those cases uh, um, occur in people between 15 and 24 years of age. So students and youth uh, are a group of risk in terms of contracting se sexually transmitted diseases. The risk factors of uh, the spread of sexually transmitted diseases are early start of sexual life, non-awareness of the issues of safe sex and symptoms of sexually transmitted diseases. <coughs> the um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, uh, uh, the fact that people are afraid that the information about their disease uh, will become widespread, so they tend not to um, go to the clinics um, <coughs> To, to their local clinics. Uh, by the way, um, uh, there are uh, hidden um, um, symptoms um, uh, of STD. And if it's asymptomatic, uh, patients don't go to um, doctors when standard antibacterial therapy is, if, is efficient. But uh, if it's already advanced, uh, there can be uh, quite um, uh, a lot of complications uh, which can uh, lead uh, uh, to uh, chronic uh, diseases, uh, to uh, pelvic dis disorders and so on. And it can lead uh, to infertility, uh, which uh, influence um, very badly on uh, demographic situation in the country. Especially um, uh, this uh, problem is relevant uh, uh, because the epidemiological screening uh, on um, STD among students uh, uh, is not conducted. That's why uh, the um, statistics um, are, are never split uh, uh, adult, uh, adults um, and uh, students. And uh, that's why we cannot um, evaluate uh, the spread of these infections among um, uh, students uh, above 17 years old. And that's why early um, detection and early treatment of these infections uh, are very important. It can be uh, also a prevention of the spread of these diseases. Uh, the goal of our research was uh, to evaluate the spread uh, of uh, uh, the most uh, frequent um, uh, infections uh, uh, like uh, um, mycoplasma genitalium, uh, chlamydia uh, thrombosis, uh, and gonorrhea and vaginalis among uh, um, uh, Moscow uh, students. Uh, in 2017-2019, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, Moscow Cosmetologist, Cosmetology Center, uh, voluntary Screening was conducted. Uh, about 3,800 students um, participated in this screening, and they were uh, detected. Um, and uh, 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 so, on these diagrams, you can see uh, uh, that mostly a ma ma male came.
male patients uh, participated in this research. The materials um, uh, of this uh, research was um, uh, urine, uh, vaginal discharge, um, uh, and also discharge of uh, urethra. Uh, also, um, uh, we used um, uh, multi thrime test. Um, where we could we can uh, uh, detect uh, four infections at the same time in one sample all students uh, were uh, di were um, you know examined anonymously <clears throat> and um, uh, 429 uh, um, infected people were detected um, uh, 308 men and 121 uh, women. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the inc incidence uh, uh, rate of infection can be seen on this diagram. Uh, uh, and uh, we could see uh, the chlamydia trochomitis growth um, in comparison with 2017 by 1.5 times, uh, the growth uh, of gonorrhea by 7 times in comparison with 2017 and uh, the growth of mycoplasma genitalium in comparison with 2018 by 6.6 .6 times um, and in comparison with 2019 5.3 times. Uh, so the growth of detection of trichomolis vaginalis uh, was not uh, detected. Uh, this um, research um, uh, showed uh, the um, uh, showed uh, uh, the uh, good results of uh, conducting screening because first of all in this case we can see uh, the, uh, the incidence rate of these infections uh, uh, also uh, it can um, uh, stop uh, the uh, epidemiological chain uh, and uh, also uh, we can um, um, slow down uh, the incidence rate of these infections but uh, we uh, have to uh, um, uh, we have uh, uh, to um, uh, make enlightenment works uh, for students um, uh, the uh, amicoplasma genitalium infection is uh, very widely spread and along with other uh, STDs uh, uh, we can have official uh, registration of this infection. Within uh, the framework of our research we conducted, we developed methodological recommendations uh, which recently were approved uh, uh, in uh, December 2019. Uh, the, uh, our recommendations regarding um, um, prevention uh, uh, of uh, this uh, uh, STDs. It can be used for um, enlightenment works uh, uh, and um, uh, increase of awareness uh, among students. Uh, but not only students, but um, each um, Moscow citizen uh, can um, um, be examined um, I, uh, for these infections in any branch of our Moscow Center of Epidemiology and Cosmetology. Take care. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we fit our schedule. Uh, and uh, so nine, uh, now it's 9.45. Uh, this is our time limit. I would like to thank all our speakers uh, for the um, interesting presentations. And you colleagues, I would like also to thank uh, for um, your attention. I can say that now, um, if um, you have uh, read this uh, central part red, uh, uh, please uh, go uh, to Bodkin um, Hall. Uh, it's on this floor, a little bit to the right. So if you have red beige, please, you're welcome uh, uh, to our next session in the Bodkin Hall. Thank you very much for this um, remarkable morning. Uh, very um, useful, uh, informative. Uh, I uh, wish you fruitful work.